I must also thank the Simons Foundation for making this possible. Uh, Science Sandbox of the Simons Foundation uh, supports this so that we can make it free and open to the public and um, they're dedicated to the principle that everyone should be engaged in the process of science. So let's thank the Simons Foundation for making this possible. So I, I have the pleasure of introducing my good friends. These are really good friends of mine. I totally did this one for my sake. <laughs> uh, my dear friend, longtime friend, Pedro Ferreira, professor at Oxford, theoretical physicist, cosmologist, my dear friend, Rachel Rosen, uh, my colleague at Columbia, professor of theoretical physics. Let's welcome our guests, please. <laughs> Oh, I don't know what just happened. I did something bad. I did something bad. Thank you. <laughs> Can you guys fix me here? So I just, uh, oh my god, you know, we were so good technologically. I'm a theoretical physicist. This is a classic joke. Don't give a theoretical physicist a practical prop. Here's what we're going to talk about. Everything any of you have ever seen and anyone has ever seen and anyone ever will see. All the stars all the galaxies, every pebble, every person makes up less than 5% of the composition of the universe. That is like a really shocking discovery. Everything we know about the universe, essentially, there's a couple of other things, but essentially, don't show them how the sausage is made. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, it's going to be so pretty now as we're doing. <laughs> um, comes to us from light. And, and so I want to ask Rachel, um, why, what else is out there? What a shocking discovery. All of this, all the galaxies, everything we see that is luminous while we sit here confined to this rock comes to us and we just wait and collect it in these stunning pictures. What's the rest of it? Yeah, so uh, all the stuff that, that Jen is talking about is really only 5% of what we call the, the energy budget of the entire universe. So when we're talking about other stuff, we're measuring this stuff as, as types of energy. Um, so there are two other types of stuff that's out there. So there's dark matter, um, which is, is stuff similar to the stuff that we're made out of, um, except that it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't interact with light. It's not something that we can see it at all. Uh, and in fact, the only way that we know that it's out there uh, is because of gravity, because it interacts gravitationally. Mm -hmm. um, and that comprises another, say, roughly 25% of the total energy budget of the universe. Um, and so you're missing roughly 70%, and the remaining 70% is this thing that we call dark energy, uh, which is probably the most, the most mysterious. Um, and again, we really only know that it's out there, uh, mostly because of how it, how it works gravitationally. Um, and this dark energy is what's responsible for, for pushing the, the universe uh, apart at an accelerated rate. But I don't want to get ahead of myself you can, here. You can go wherever you want. Okay. <laughs> but Pedro, I mean, you and I were postdocs together at Berkeley. We were in an office so small when we first met that um, we had chairs back to back and we would just sort of like lean back and talk to each other like this. Right? And this was the era. I mean, why is this such a big deal? This idea of dark, a dark sector, a sector of the universe that's not visible, that we don't even know what it is, we just call it by these proxy names. Why is it such a big deal? So, well, when we shared this office, which was about two by three feet, it was really very small. Um, the kind of stuff that we did was we made stuff up, right? We, we were theorists, so we just made stuff up. Um, and people would make up models of the universe. They would, you know, think up, think of what the universe was made. And there were all, all these different possibilities. And one of the possibilities was that the universe, a big part of the universe, was made up of some thing like dark energy. So th this idea was around. But it was such a bizarre idea that people really, it, it, was, it was kind of the fringe idea. It was the crackpot idea. People really didn't take it seriously. Well, wh where we were, where we were at Berkeley together. In other offices were the people who actually did the hard science, which were the people who built stuff. Hey. Made, well, <laughs> they built experiments that went out and measured things. And there were two groups. There was one group that measured, that looked at very distant exploding stars, these things called supernovae. And from the way that these how brightly these, these things exploded, they could figure out how fast the universe was expanding. 
There was another group of people that were looking at this relic light left over from the Big Bang. And from that, they were able to figure out how much stuff there was in the universe. And I think when we, while we were there, these things came together. Just after we left, all these pieces came together. And, uh, and people figured out that the universe was full of stuff, and we didn't see most of that stuff, and it had to be like dark. But let's energy. regroup. I mean, here, these are every image you're seeing here is a real picture. It's not a cartoon of actual galaxies, right? So there are yeah. 100 billion stars in our own galaxy in the Milky Way, and there are as many galaxies as there are stars in the Milky Way, 100 billion or several hundred billion, few hundred billion lots. in our observable universe, lots. And all of that is less than 5% of what exists. Everything else, by far, the dominant component is utterly dark. I think you can even make it worse, right? Mm -hmm. Which is if we just talk about the stars, yeah. it's even less than 1%, because then there's all this gas lying around that we don't see. So and there are black holes. And there are black holes. Which so are significant. There's a lot of stuff. So the dark stuff's the best stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. The dark sector is the best stuff. But this, when we were kids, this was stunning, because when Einstein was alive, he didn't know there were other galaxies out there, let alone hundreds of billions of galaxies, right? So suddenly, the world becomes so rich in the luminous stuff and then we find out that there's this dark sector and we have no idea what it is. Mm. It's like we, we learned enough to learn that we don't know a lot. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. So if we were to have magical dark matter or dark energy glasses, what would it look like? <laughs> Wouldn't it be like a storm? Like right now, is dark matter right here? Yes. It's right here. So one of the ideas is that dark matter is they're little particles like everything else. They just mm -hmm. don't emit light. And right. so we're flooded by so dark So if I could put them, I would see a s rainstorm. Yeah. Right now, through us, yeah. a rainstorm of dark particles. But they just, they know that we're mostly empty space, so they don't care. So they yeah. fly right through. What about the dark energy? Rachel's better at dark energy. <laughs> <laughs> would it be like, what would it be like? I'm not sure you would be able to see it. Well, so, well no, so you couldn't see it. But yeah. I'm just saying, if you had some magical glasses that you could put on that interacted with dark energy, yeah. would we be like in an ocean? Yeah, it would be, it would be like some constant flood. And so, you right, know, an ocean with like no surface, no floor. That's right, that's right. And, and so what's happening is that as the universe is, is expanding, wherever it expands into, you get more of this dark energy. I mean, I think that's sort of the, the miraculous thing about it is that ordinary types of matter will dilute as the universe expands. You know, you start out with some dust and the universe gets bigger and the dust is going to dilute as the universe expands. But dark energy isn't like that. If you imagine it like the ocean, like you were saying, that as the universe expands, you get more and more ocean uh, as it's the universe infinite. gets bigger and bigger. In every direction. That's with right. no surface, no floor. So if I could see it right, right now in this room, we are swimming through a dark energy sea. That's we right. just don't interact with it. That's right. Well, and in, and in some sense, it is, you know, pushing us apart. Um, you know, we're very lucky in that we're held together by, by gravity, but it is, um, you know, the gravitational force that's keeping us together is fighting against the dark energy that's trying to push us apart. We're just, we're just lucky that the gravitational force is winning in this mm -hmm. case. Well, we'll talk about our far future and our uh, pessimistic <laughs> prognosis <laughs> in the face of dark energy, but Einstein, Pedro, when he first gave us the language in which we even were able to start to consider these things, he wouldn't have thought of dark energy, or would he? I mean, what, what happened back when he first started thinking about gravity as space-time that led to this sort of revolution? Well, it turns out that he did think of dark energy, um, but for the wrong reasons. So he, he came up with this theory known as general relativity, which, I mean, the only thing we really need to take away f at the moment is that it, he posited mm -hmm. that space and time get a life of its own, that it's not just this static place where you put things, that it evolves. And uh, using that theory, you can work out what happens to space and time, and you find that it, you know, it either expands or contracts, but it def definitely doesn't s sit still. So he thought, well, we live in a universe. He said the universe is static. He thought the universe isn't evolving. And if you think so of So he thought it was permanent, that the universe lived forever into the past yes. and would live forever into the future. And it wasn't evolving. It was just there. And so he thought, well, but hang on. If I put stuff in this universe, we know what gravity does. It pulls, so space-time will collapse. So he, he invented this thing 
this cosmological term, as he puts it, to push space-time apart. And so he balanced the stuff in the universe with this weird cosmological term, what we call dark Because energy. he was trying to fine-tune things to meet his exactly. previous belief. His complete prejudice, he didn't think the universe evolved, so he balanced this weird thing with the rest of the he stuff. He didn't know what it was. It was just a mathematical term. Just a mathematical term. It yeah. had no physical basis. Yeah. It had no like origin in any experience or anything we had measured before. Exactly. Before. So, y you know, it's the pushing of this thing against the pulling of stuff. So that the universe would be permanent. Exactly. But it's like Einstein can't even make a mistake. He, he was his most greg egregious error, yeah. right? What did, what did he call it, Rachel? His I mean, famously. greatest blunder or something like yeah, that. Yeah, his greatest blunder. Yeah. Why do you think he called it a, his greatest blunder? Well, I, th I think... Because he made a lot more mistakes. He published wrong papers all the time. He once famously <laughs> said something like, you don't need to worry about my name being on wrong papers. My name is on plenty of wrong papers. Like, he was not afraid to be wrong. So why was this one such a huge blunder? I mean, maybe, maybe just because it exposed the prejudice that he had beforehand. I, think so too. I mean, so his, his equations were actually predicting that the universe wasn't static. I mean, if you just take Einstein's equations at face value, it would tell us that we didn't li live in a static universe. Yeah. And he, couldn't, he didn't believe his own equations. I mean, he didn't believe that that would be correct. And so he, he came up with, at the time, this, this sort of artificial seeming mechanism to correct that, which turned out to be completely unnecessary mm -hmm. and for the purpose that he wanted. He threw it, it. away, but the guy can't right. be wrong because here it is again. So yeah. we'll talk about this later. So, so what he called it was, was the cosmological constant. So it's just a mathematical term he was using to balance his equations, which he then threw away. And it's now revived in this physical phenomenon. Now we're struggling to understand what it is, right? We're just giving it this proxy name, dark energy, but we don't actually know what it is. So we're back, this is back, what, 1916. So then what happens, um, what happens next? So people... Pedro's book, by the way, The Perfect Theory, is a beautiful and probably the most comprehensive and subtle um, telling of the history of... of the story of Einstein's theory and, and the implications for modern cosmology. Well, thanks so for that plug. Well, yeah, <laughs> and I get uh, 50 cents for every sale. <laughs> anyway, we move on. And so, <laughs> um, it turns out that these two guys in the early 20s got hold of his equations and worked out what in fact they predicted. And they both predicted that the universe was expanding. And Einstein really didn't like it. In, in fact, one of them, this um, Belgian priest, Lemaitre, sent him his paper. And Einstein didn't answer, didn't, didn't say anything. They ran into each other in 1927 at this conference in Solvay. And Lemaitre ca catches a cab with him and asks him, did you get my paper? And Einstein says, yes, yes, your, your mathematics is correct, but your physics is abominable. And he, he really didn't, he didn't accept this idea that the universe was expanding. And then in 1929, Edwin Hubble, this, this uh, American astronomer based in California, went out and looked for the hallmark of an expanding universe. He looked at galaxies moving relative to us, found that they were all moving away, which, it, which is, you know, you can relate to an expanding universe, and showed that the universe was expanding. And that's where Einstein realized that he committed this blunder in trying mm -hmm. to construct this static universe. So I want to go back to Hubble, because it's an amazing story. So here's Hubble at Mount Wilson, the most powerful telescope at the time, um, looming a little bit outside of Pasadena, where Caltech is now. And um, you have to realize that at the time, Einstein, nobody knew, including Einstein, that there were other galaxies out there. So we, even, we live in this stunning spiral galaxy, the Milky Way, this collection of 300 billion stars, whatever it is. We weren't sure if that was it. It's just like not knowing if our solar system was everything. So Hubble is the first person to be able to identify that there are other galaxies out here. And this image is from the Hubble Space Telescope, named in his honor. And these were not the kinds of images he was collecting at the time. But now we know that not only are there other galaxies out there, but they are as plentiful as the stars in our own, as we said. And, and then he does this other thing, which you've just mentioned, which he says, the galaxies aren't static. They're moving, but it's not, so why isn't this like, Rachel, I want to ask you this, because everyone's going to ask after, so if I don't preempt it, why isn't this like an explosion in space with a center 
from which all the galaxies are radiating? Why do we talk about it as the expansion of space, which is profoundly different? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So it's, um, you know, we believe in this thing called the cosmological principle, which basically says that, that our position in the universe shouldn't be special, that humans shouldn't occupy a preferred place in the universe. And so when Hubble looked out and saw everything sort of moving away from us, the idea is, is that, you know, an alien observer on some other galaxy looking out should see the exact same thing. There shouldn't be anything special about our... But our, if a our star point. explodes, I point to the center. That's right. So this is somehow really fundamentally different. That's right, that's right. So, so what this means is that it's not that everything is expanding away from us, it's that anybody in the universe would see everything expanding away from them. And the only way that this makes sense is if the universe itself is expanding, if everything is expanding away from everything else. So when you say the universe is expanding, what do you mean exactly? Are the galaxies physically actually moving? Well, so they're moving away from each other. Um, so the, the analogy that people like to use is you can imagine the surface of a balloon and you can imagine drawing little dots on the surface of the balloon. Um, and as you blow up the balloon, these dots are all going to be moving away from each other. And so if you're somebody who just lives on the surface of the balloon, there's no preferred point there. There's no point where, you know, the balloon started to expand on the surface and everything's moving away from that point. It's really everything is moving away from everything else. So um, so in the balloon analogy, like if I, if I put dots on the balloon, I stain it with ink. The ink stains are stained. They don't budge. That's right. It's the skin of the balloon that stretches. That's right. So, so what's playing the role of the skin of the balloon is space-time itself. That's right. So this is a pretty surreal, that's pretty surreal. I mean, you, the three of us talk about this all the time. We take it for granted, but do you ever pause do you ever just pause and think, what does that mean, that the space itself is getting bigger? What is it? What is that space-time that's getting bigger between the things? So, in other words, the galaxies, in some sense, are frozen. They're hardly moving. They're hardly moving. But the space between them is stretching. And what is that? I mean, this is space. I can't grab onto it. What is it? No, I mean, it, it is. It is pretty mind-blowing, and even at the time when Hubble made this measurement, it wasn't immediate that people were interpreting as the expansion of space. Mm -hmm. You know, they just couldn't complete. They came up with names for it. They called it the redshift effect. It was this strange thing of light propagating through space-time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it is pretty mind-blowing. So, um, in the context of what you're talking about with what Einstein originally tried to do, he tried to change his mathematics with some arbitrary thing he called the cosmological constant, so this wouldn't happen, right? So Hubble comes along, observes it, and he says, oh, whoa, he capitulates, he realizes the universe is expanding, and then what are the implications of that besides just that the universe is expanding? Well, he, got, he gets rid of that cosmological term. Right? He throws it away, he thinks it's junk, and, he thinks and it's, it's junk. back to haunt us. Yeah. It's now what we call dark matter is basically equivalent to this term. Dark energy. I'm sorry. Dark energy is <laughs> <laughs> basically equivalent to this term. But so it's interesting because for 50 years or 60 years, it's in the wilderness. Yeah, it's totally in the wilderness. Yeah. So when you were a young cosmologist, dark energy was not taken that seriously. No, I mean, I remember you and I went to this debate. You, we went to Princeton, I think. Oh, yeah, I remember that. To a conference oh, called Critical the Dialogues in Cosmology, where five people stood up on a stage and each one defended their own model right. of the universe. Yeah. And there was one guy, I think it was a guy called Michael Turner from Chicago, who stood you up. You think it was a guy called Michael Turner? Yeah. He's, he's otherwise known, I'm going to say it publicly with a camera on, <laughs> as the Dark Lord. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Dark Lord stands up and defends a universe with a cosmological constant, with dark energy. And his model was the least favored model. It was the one that people thought of, that's just, you know, there are so many problems with that model, so many fundamental problems. Um, and this so was 96. what does it mean to be talking about something that we don't know what it is? We're just giving it a name. The name dark energy is solely a proxy to mean something we can't see, right? But we, we indirectly infer from the expansion of the universe. What is the effect on the expansion of the universe that's so special that we infer it's there? I'm asking it so I don't know the answer. 
Well, it push, well you, you can answer. Well, so it, 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 yeah, it causes an accelerated expansion of the universe. So if, if you believe that you know, gravity is really the dominant force at large scales, gravity is this attractive force, it should be pulling everything uh, closer together. So even if things were expanding originally, uh, gravity would tell you that that expansion should be slowing down and right. maybe eventually everything would collapse back in on itself. Um, and so this is, this is what people believe that our universe looked like um, before, you know, once we had thrown away this, this cosmological constant term. But then when we, we went out and observed, and this was in the late 90s, that in fact not only was the universe expanding, but it was expanding at a faster and faster rate, um, which is in contradiction with, with this notion of gravity just being this attractive force. And so dark energy is this stand-in for whatever is forcing the universe to expand at a faster and faster rate. So I sometimes liken it to saying, like, if I was sitting in this chair and suddenly me and my chair started, like, floating across the room, I would not know what was doing it, and I would not maybe for a long time be able to identify it, but I would know for sure something was causing this to happen. And that's sort of what's happening with the universe. It's getting faster and faster. We know that, we see it, we just don't know what it is that's driving it, so we give it this proxy name, this mysterious name. But this isn't the first time this has happened, right? I mean, in mm -hmm. the 1930s, there was this process, this radioactive process called beta decay. And people would look at it, and they would see that there was missing energy. And there was missing energy, and you, you couldn't explain it. And this guy, this Swiss physicist, Wolfgang Pauli, comes along and says, there's a missing particle. I'm going to call it the neutrino. Mm -hmm. And then they found the neutrino. So, you know, there was something missing. Some guy predicted there was something there. And then they went, and through other methods, they discovered this particle. So, do, but that's, okay, so that's a really interesting example, because then there's a direct detection identifying. It's a particle, it has these properties, we, know, we now know what it is. Do you ever think we'll get there with dark energy? Right now, it's literally just this weird name we give to this invisible, unseen thing that we're swimming in, and none of us know what it is. Do you think we will ever be able to do that experiment, where we actually get our hands on it and say, ah, it's in my hands, I know what it is. Do you think that will happen in our lifetime? I have a view, but you have, you must No, I want to hear it, Pedro, <laughs> I mean, Rachel, Pedro, Rachel, Pedro. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think it's possible that we won't. Um, so, so in fact, you know, so far we've been using this, this cosmological constant sort of interchangeably with dark energy. Um, but the cosmological constant is, is only one possibility for what this dark energy could be. So it's something that we know that if we add it to, to our equations, it's going to make the universe fly apart faster and faster. Um, but that doesn't have to be what dark energy is. So if dark energy ends up being something more exotic, if it's, you know, some new force of matter, some, sorry, some new type of matter, or if it's some um, change in gravity, then I think in that case, you know, we have have some hope of actually detecting it, that there would be some other consequences. Um, but I think if dark energy truly is this cosmological constant now at the end of the day. So you're saying cosmological constant, people don't know what that means. Oh, I mean, I, we're, yes. so we're saying like it's a math term that Einstein put in, but to you and Pedro and I, it means something about empty space. That's right, that's so right. What is it, so what does it mean in terms of physically just the energy of empty space? Yeah, so, so we believe something that, that quantum mechanics tells us um, is that empty space isn't actually empty. Um, that you have pairs of particles that are sort of constantly popping into existence and then annihilating with each other. Um, so, it's so like a froth. Yeah, some, some background froth. And, and even if you, you know, sort of clear everything out and make new empty space, you're still going to have this froth appearing. There's no way to get rid of it, really. Uh, and so there's some energy associated with this froth. Um, and that's, that's what, we, uh, is what we call this cosmological constant, is the energy that's associated with empty space, with the vacuum. But I think even that is incredibly, a really ponderous idea that nothing has an energy, right? So I'm used to thinking um, a car crashing into a wall has a certain energy, and I'm used to thinking about things dropping from heights having energies. But, I mean, Pedro, what is the significance of nothing well, having energy. I think what this means is there's no such thing as nothing, right? <laughs> as you cool something down to the lowest possible temperature, try and remove all the particles, everything, everything, and there's always something left over. There's you but what's left over isn't necessarily material like particles. No, it's I, I it could literally have no particles in it. But th well, you can. One way of thinking about it is you can have virtual particles popping in and out of existence. So there's the possibility with quantum mechanics that stuff can come in and out of existence, and that frothing. 
I mean, it's, is that energy? It's kind of like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle saying, I can't know a particle is there, so I can't know it's not there. Exactly. So if I can't know it's there and I can't know it's not there, there's this sort of average energy associated with that uncertainty. So can't we calculate that? Can't we figure out what the energy of nothing would be in terms of quantum mechanics where, you know, this is, we're, what's amazing, which Einstein also reflected on, one of the greatest mysteries is that math works, right? That why can't we figure out what the energy of nothing should be on the basis of what we know? Well, we do, and we try, and so we can go and calculate what that should be, and we get it wrong. In other words, the number that we get when we do that calculation is um, one with 120 zeros. Bigger than what we actually bigger get? Bigger than what we actually measure. It's just so huge that our universe would be a blip. Mm -hmm. It would come in and out of existence in an Because instant. the dark energy would make the universe expand so quickly that yep. it would just be like a heat death. Exactly. Yeah. So what do you think about this issue that, that there's energy of nothing? Do you think that that's what it is? The dark energy is the energy of nothingness? I mean, I, I think it's a very compelling idea, and it, mm -hmm. it certainly fits to a large degree with what we observe, except for this discrepancy that, that Pedro was talking about, which I, I think is a very profound pathology. I mean, quantum you mechanics... Mean, you mean yeah. that as far as we know, it should be huge? That's right. And why did it crop up? somewhere midway in the history of the universe. Like, That's right, and at this seems very really small value. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is, this is not a, like an ambiguous prediction of quantum mechanics. It's a very clear prediction. You should have this vacuum energy. Its value should be at least this much, and yet when we go out and observe, we're, we're wrong what? by this Why should I trust amount. quantum mechanics so much? <laughs> well, we have verified some of it. I yeah. mean, isn't quantum mechanics the most accurately tested paradigm in the history of science? to the yes. furthest decimal points. It, when, when you hear about these accelerator experiments and all of these things, they're testing quantum mechanics, even though we don't actually fundamentally understand it. It's the most accurately tested paradigm in the history of science, and it's giving us a prediction that's off by a googoplex times a googoplex times a googoplex. Right. No, it is, it is. So what else could the dark energy be if it's not the energy of empty space? Well, Stumped. so there, 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 are sort of, there are sort of two different possibilities. So, um, you know, Einstein's equations, what it does is, uh, on one side of the equation, it sort of describes the matter content of the universe, what stuff we think exists in the universe. And on the other side, it, it describes the curvature of space-time or the, the gravitational force. And so, you, in one sense, you can think of this dark energy uh, as, as being something has to change with this equation. We have to tweak this equation Wait, somehow. Can I translate? Yeah, yeah. Because not everyone actually appreciates it. Like my mother would be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is stuff curves space. That's right. If we know what stuff is in the universe, we can predict what's curving space. Vice versa, if we're observing expansion of space, we can deduce certain things about what's doing, what's causing it, but not the details. That's right, that's exactly right. Okay, yeah. but you had another point, sorry that I... No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. well, so just to say that, that if we want to explain this dark energy, yeah. we're pretty much limited to either tweaking one side of the equation or tweaking the other side of the mm -hmm. equation. So tweaking the matter side of the equation means that we have to introduce some new form of matter into the universe, so some exotic form of matter um, that would have this sort of repulsive effect that would sort of permeate all of space and time and be able to push everything apart. Um, and on the other side, you could, you could modify the curvature side of the equations, which means basically modifying our theory of gravity and saying that, that matter doesn't curve space-time the way that we thought it did, the way that Einstein thought it did, um, but maybe there's, there's some other uh, theory of gravity that we so could wait, write you're down. So you're sort of saying maybe dark energy isn't real at all. There's no such thing as dark energy. It's just that Einstein's theory isn't right. That's right. That's one possibility that people look at. Pedro, what do you think of that? Do you think it's possible that Einstein's theory is just not right and that, and that we're incorrectly interpreting the expansion of the universe, the accelerated expansion of the universe to mean that there's dark energy, when maybe it's just that gravity behaves differently when we look at such huge scales on the universe? I mean, it's a controversial proposal. And if you think about it, <coughs> Einstein's theory of general relativity has been tested to exquisite precision you know, in the solar system, around planets, and it really remarkably precisely. Um, 
but then we use it to predict what happens to the cosmos, okay? Which means that we're using it to predict what happens on scales, which are um, one with 15 zeros bigger than the scales on which it's been tested. So it's a huge extrapolation. Mm -hmm. And we seem to get it right, because the universe is expanding ar around about the way we expect it to expand. It all is kind of roughly right, except in the details. And those details are the things we're talking so, about. So let's talk about the details. So Einstein doesn't want to believe the universe is expanding, so he changes his math to try to force it not to expand. Hubble observes the expansion. He goes, oh my god, I fucked up. He throws out this term. What are the implications if we run the movie backwards of the expanding universe? So if the universe is expanding, everything's getting further and further apart. Um, what is the obvious, I mean, I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm asking it in such a pedestrian way, but what are the obvious implications of that? What is, if we wind back the clock? Yeah. Well, the universe gets denser and denser and denser and gets hotter and hotter and hotter in the past. In the past? In the past, and, you know, if we look, another aspect is the universe, we look around the universe and it's made of galaxies and stars. As we wind back, we'll see the formation of those galaxies and the formation of those stars. And so we think of the universe in the past as this kind of amorphous blob of very hot stuff, very dense hot stuff. So there was an early universe. Exactly. There was a, there was a beginning. Yeah. Now this idea of a modern Big Bang was completely, I mean, scientifically original in that sense, right? That the idea of a genesis, I mean, Einstein himself, as you said, resisted it. He wanted to believe the universe was permanent that it had always existed, infinitely in the past and infinitely in the future, and here he has to accept that the universe actually must have had a beginning and um, in a Big Bang. And so how long ago are we looking at here? It's not that long ago. You guys know the numbers. Stop acting <laughs> coy. How long ago did what? The Big Bang happened. Oh, so 13 billion years. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you run the movie forward, you have a universe that is created out of this hot primordial soup, which you're describing. Do you think the dark energy and the dark matter are created then? Are they dominant back then? What's going on back then? Like all this stuff. Like what are we, this, this less than 5% of the entire observable universe? We're like this ashy residue or something. What are we from the Big Bang? The Big Bang creates what? So there, there are many different components. So you're going to have you know, matter, both the visible matter and this dark matter. You're going to have radiation, mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to have dark energy. Um, mm -hmm. So they're, they're all going to be there at the so beginning the dark the energy's there in the beginning. It's absolutely. Well, it's, it, assuming that, yeah, if we trust our model, it should still be there in the but very it's beginning. So why isn't, so was the universe accelerating in ex expansion back then? Well, so, so there is a, a period of accelerated expansion mm -hmm. in the early universe, uh, which is known as inflation. Um, but it's not clear that that, that period of acceleration uh, is due to the same dark energy or the same cosmological constant that's causing us to, to expand at an accelerated rate today. Um, but what's really happening is that because you have these, these various substances, these various types of matter or types of energy, um, as the universe expands, they dilute in different ways. So... Um, in the very beginning, it's, it's, we expect to see a radiation-dominated universe, that that would be the most, so most just important. Light. Yeah, just, just light, basically. Um, but this is going to... But as our stuff, so we're talking about, we're, we are things that are not dark. We're matter that is not dark. We interact with light. I am seeing you literally because of light <laughs> bouncing off of you, and I see you, and you're luminous, and that's how I see you. And so it's all this stuff made back then. Uh, yes, yeah. So it just this little bit is made back then. And then the dark matter and the dark energy, but they're not so dominating. It's an interesting point you're asking because, it want, you know, if we look at our theories of the universe, we kind of expect everything to be symmetric. And so while we... Equal proportions, equal like proportions, egalitarian, like... like every is, and, and for example, you're talking about the stuff we're made of. We kind of expect the universe to be made of matter and antimatter in equal proportions. Mm -hmm. and it should all annihilate itself. So right, so, so, so matter, if I have an electron and a positron, it's antiparticle, and they come together, yeah. they just disappear into a flash of light, exactly. and the matter's gone. So one of the questions you can ask, and I don't think there's an answer yet, is why is there just a little bit more matter than antimatter? Right, why isn't our universe full of so only of light? Exactly. Why is there anything? Yeah, exactly. So that yeah. is, you know, one of the open problems is that. Yeah. So, so we know that 
in some profound sense, these questions go back to the origin of the universe. Fundamentally, somehow in the fundamental laws, why there are these imbalances and why there are these subtle differences. So I wanted to ask you, Pedro, how do we, I know we're saying, oh, the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate, but what are the, what's the other evidence that, that dark energy exists? Um, well, I mean, the other, it's, uh, there is, the, well, the interesting thing about it is the evidence for dark energy is a, a combination of lots of different pieces. And one of them is when we look at the universe, when we look at this, when we look at the relic light left over from this very hot beginning, we can, we can map it out quite well. It's, it's something called the cosmic microwave background. And from it, we can basically infer um, the geometry of the universe. And we find that the geometry of the universe is basically the geometry we learned in school. The geometry of, you know, um, triangles have, a, uh, you add up the angles in a triangle, it's 180 degrees, all this really basic geometry. And then we, then we go back to this thing that Jana said, which is the equation says, space-time curvature or curvature or space-time equals stuff. And from that, we can infer how much stuff there is in the universe. And that's a crucial step, because by, look, by doing that, we can figure out that there's much more stuff in the universe than what we see. So that's a, a, that's a key part, is there's more stuff around. Now, we don't know what this stuff does. The, it could be making the universe accelerate or not accelerate, but there's all this extra stuff, and we see that from the geometry of the universe. So again, it's sort of indirect. It's Always an indirect. indirect suggestion yeah. um, that the universe isn't just what the eye perceives. Exactly. I mean, literally, and also figuratively extending the eye beyond just human perception to all of the satellites and all of the telescopes and all the light collected. But it is kind of amazing how reliant we have been on light for all this time. Yeah. sitting there, and that to think that 95% of the universe is dark. I mean, Rachel, do you find this depressing or exciting? I mean, it, it, I get paid to study this, so <laughs> exciting, definitely. <laughs> yeah. You have a job. That's right. <laughs> I mean, what, what we were talking earlier about the fact that one of the reasons why it was such a spectacular discovery was because it was so unexpected. It was so unreal, and there was tremendous resistance in the field to the idea that this was true, right? That, I mean, come on, Pedro, we heard so many times, especially astronomers, that this was nonsense. The universe is what you see. What you see is what you get, yeah. and that's the whole thing. And as of what year was it when suddenly everybody accepted it? It happened really fast. It's pretty remarkable because we, when we were growing up, right, yeah. we were led to believe that this was just a nonsense idea. Nonsense. And Total in nonsense. It was in 98, when mm -hmm. all, 98, between 98 and 2000, when all the pieces came together. Yeah. And it was a radical shift. Do you remember your personal radical shift? Yeah. Do you remember thinking, oh, whoa, this isn't nonsense? Yeah, about 2000. And, and what was that like to think, oh, I've been studying astrophysics, I believe in reality, I believe in measuring the world, and I'm learning that most of it is invisible. <laughs> Literally I, invisible. I found it really exciting, and I think it showed that it works, you know, mm -hmm. that what we do works, and that we bang our heads against the wall for, for decades, and then things work out, and we figure out something new, mm -hmm. and it all fits, you know, the, so I was, I was thrilled. I was totally thrilled. Isn't it? And so by now, Nobel Prizes have been doled out. So it better be true. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to reverse that. So when was the Nobel Prize awarded? Now I don't remember. Uh, for 2011, 2011 12, yeah, something like that, for, yeah. for, for the measurement of... The supernova. For the, yeah. So um, do you think, Rachel, there's any way that it's absolutely, I mean, we've already discussed this, but that it's absolutely not the case, that there is this invisible energy, but it's actually, what else could it be besides gravity? What are the really, like, out there possibilities? So let's see, so there are, there are a few different things. Um, so, so one is just a, a sort of an exotic type of particle. Um, so there are, there are scalar particles, or a, it's a, a certain type of particle. <laughs> um, I'm going to give that a pass. <laughs> yeah, <very good. laughs> um, that could exist that has special properties that it would it would sort of mimic this dark energy that that to some degree. So uh, there's stuff. There's something out there. There's some and it's stuff, physical and stuff. And we'll find it. It's physical stuff. That's it's right. Like, and I you can think of it like yeah. particles. As yeah. 
So I think there's actually a huge detail that we've sort of forgotten to express, is that when things don't interact with light, they also don't interact with us, right? So, so you know the story when you were kids that atoms are mostly empty space, there's a nucleus, and then there's like way, way away, there's like an electron, and mostly it's empty space. So why can't I put my hand through my leg? And the reason I can't put my hand through my leg is because it interacts, right? And it's the same interaction as the reason why you can see me with the light bouncing off my face. And if you don't interact with light, you also don't interact with my leg, and you just pass right through. And, um, and so this feeling that we're solid and we can grab stuff and we can hold on to it and I don't fall through my chair is all based on the fact that we interact with light, ultimately. So you're suggesting that there are these particles that we're swimming in that would look like a storm around us, were we able to somehow magically see them, just don't notice us. We're just invisible to each other. Oh, sorry, I got too close to my mic. So do you think that it's possible that there's an entire dark sector out there that's not just random particles, but maybe they've formed dark planets, and maybe they've evolved dark life, and maybe they're walking around, <laughs> and they don't see us any more than we see them. I mean, I, I think that's a definite possibility. So we, we certainly have, you know, observational constraints on how much of this, this self-interacting new particles can be. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, you know, given that, that the visible sector, that the sector that we live in, uh, is in fact incredibly complicated. You know, the number of particles we have, we have a lot of different particles, there are lots of different right. forces Maybe they're that they theorizing about us. Maybe That's they're right. like, oh my God, we can only explain 95% of the universe. <laughs> there's 5% we can't see. What the hell is it, right? That's right, that's right. And they're like, oh, it's probably just some dust. Yes. <laughs> floating around. They're like not anticipating we have microphones and glasses of water, right? <laughs> and complex interactions. So is it possible there's an entire dark universe coexisting with us? It's totally possible. But it's not, the thing is, even though this stuff is invisible, we can, we can see how it, if, if it interacts through gravity. Right. And so we try and look at but its gravitational effects. Now, it's a re that's a really terrible way to look at things. It's a really rough way of looking at things. But again, it's like if your chair was blown across the, s the stage right now, right. I would know some force acted on you. Yes. I might not know which force, yeah. but I would be absolutely confident that some force had acted on you. And that's kind of the situation we're in. Yeah. But we're mo so subdominant, so much less significant. Would they even notice us? Like 95% of the universe is in this dark sector. The 5% that's us, what do we do? I mean, I think if there were dark galaxies, independent yeah. dark yeah. galaxies, yeah. we might be able to see it through the way, uh, through space-time, because they affect space-time, and then light propagates through space-time, mm -hmm. and we would see this. So you would see the bending of light, bending or you would see light. lensing, but we do see that... We do see that. Yeah. That's exactly how we yeah. see dark matter. And so the question is, will those measurements ever be good enough that we can start picking up these fine details that you're talking about, mm -hmm. like you know, dark galaxies and dark stars and mm -hmm. things like that? It, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it, it all depends on how good these measurements can be. Mm -hmm. So um, we have behind us a map of, um, can you explain to us what this map represents? Because it's hard to so interpret is, for people. This is a map, so you, can, you sit here and you put a telescope up and you look at a galaxy, you measure its position in the sky and you measure its distance from us. And you build up a catalog of these galaxies. So you build up a catalog with millions, hundreds of millions of galaxies. So we're sitting, we're sitting in the center over there and each one of those points is, is one of those galaxies. And what you find is that it builds up this thing that is called the cosmic web, which is this, this tapestry, this tapestry with filaments and voids so, and so walls just of galaxies, uh, of, you know, this tapestry of light. Just to be clear, one of those dots, pixels, is how big? I mean, not literally like in detail, but it's, it's not a star. No, no, it's a galaxy. It's a galaxy. It's a galaxy. So galaxy. every pixel is a galaxy. Exactly, with hundreds of billions of stars, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So it's, you know, it's a big object. <laughs> <laughs> it's as heavy as hundreds of billions of suns, so it's really a massive thing. Um, and so what does that tell us about the dark energy? Well, one of the things you, do, you can do is you can, look at, you can look at this distribution, right? The way that the, this, all this is, is set up. 
and it's basically this this thing is assembled through gravity right and there's dark energy out there and dark energy affects gravity right it affects pushes and pulls so by looking at this this cosmic web you can start to learn something about what other forces are well what other stuff is around there which will which will form it so i've heard you describe it as archaeology which i think is a really nice yeah. comparison so imagine like i'm literally looking at rocks and imprints in it. Can I do the same thing here? This is exactly the same. You know, when we look at this thing, we're looking in the past because it takes time for the light from these galaxies to reach us. So we're, we're, look, we're taking a snapshot through time as well. And by looking at how this is assembled we can, and how it's assembled as a function of time, we can see how the dark energy has been, in, has been affecting the gravitational force. So it's left force. an imprint in our history. Exactly. In we the look, universe. We look at the effect of dark energy, uh, the imprint of dark energy, in the way that this stuff is assembled. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get to the hard stuff. <laughs> so if dark energy is not the energy of empty space that comes from quantum mechanics, which is very sensible description. And if it's not that maybe Einstein's theory of curved space-time is going to look a little different than we anticipated, what are some of the more wild ideas? Like, what about the multiverse? And Rachel, I think you're my, you're my target for <laughs> this question. <laughs> what, is, what are the implications for an idea that our universe is no more singular than our sun. Our galaxy is no more unique than any other galaxy. And maybe our universe also follows that same pattern of not being particularly unique and that we live in a multiplicity of universes, all of which just randomly have this weird thing, which is purely, in some sense, mathematical and not physical. That's right. Yeah. So, so I mean, we have this this very well tested, you know, standard model of particle physics, standard model of cosmology that, when we look out, makes these incredibly accurate predictions. But you can start to wonder. You can say, well, why does the standard model have these particular particles in it? Why are there these forces? And in particular, why do these certain constants that appear uh, in our universe, why do they have these very particular values? Now, it could be that there's some profound reason behind that. It could be that there's some master theory and that any universe you know, has to have this particle content and has to have these forces and have to has, has to have these constants with these particular values. Or you can say like what you're saying, maybe our universe isn't unique. Maybe there's nothing special about you know, the value of the electric charge in our universe. You, know, you could ask the same question, why does our solar system have eight or nine planets? There's no profound answer to that question. There are many solar systems and they have many different types of planets. And so you could say the same thing about our universe. Maybe there are just many universes and all of these different universes have different particles in them and have different forces and have different fundamental constants. Um, and one of these constants is this value of the cosmological constant. And so there is just this multiplicity of universes having so, all sorts of different so values. So like meaning, meaning, you know, the like gravity is really weak. So even though the entire Earth is pulling on me, I'm going to be get able to get up out of my chair, right? That's but right. I could imagine a universe in which gravity was really strong and even on the Earth, I couldn't get up out of my chair. And similarly, I could imagine a universe in which the energy of nothing was zero, and I could imagine a universe where the energy of nothing was a lot, and the universe was expanding incredibly rapidly, so rapidly that there was no time for galaxies to evolve or something like that. And we just happen, like, in the same way that we just, ha not just happen, but we just happen to find a habitable planet on which to evolve, we happen to find a habitable universe. The others wouldn't be habitable, most likely. That's right. I mean, certainly, if you if you live in the universe where a universe where the cosmological constant is so big that say two particles would never come into contact with each other, that you know the moment you have the Big Bang, everything just flies apart so that nothing ever sees anything else. Certainly, in that universe, you would never create 
us. You would never create a person who would be sitting here wondering why the cosmological constant has that particular value. So there's this argument that, that goes by the name of this anthropic principle that basically just says that, you know, if you have this, this multiverse, this mul multiplicity of universes, then almost by definition, you have to live in a universe where the value of the cosmological constant is compatible with having observers who are able to sit around and ask questions about the value of the cosmological constant. Right. So the only reason we're here to have this conversation is because we live in a habitable universe, basically. I mean, Pedro, do you, do you buy this, the multiverse? Suge but basically, the multiverse suggestion is kind of a cop-out. It's saying we don't ever need to actually put our hands on the thing that's called dark energy. It's just the energy of nothing, and it's different in every universe. And in ours, it happens to be this. It's just random. What, what's so your feeling about that? I have a pretty that? ambivalent relation to it, <laughs> that relationship to the multiverse, mm -hmm. which is... It is a possibility, and we can't pretend it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's an, a possibility which is impossible to test. We have no way of figuring out if it's the right thing, but it's a possibility. And so the universe may be unkind, the multiverse may be unkind enough to exist, <laughs> and we just have to accept that it is that way. But I prefer to work on other ideas. So I think, you know, I don't think it's a fruitful t thing to think about, but it's a possibility. Now, when you, when you think about us on this, like, little blue rock, which very few of us have ever left, and that almost everything we know about the universe has come to us from light, and realizing, inferring, that 95% of it is invisible, um, isn't it startling that we can also start to project not only about our past, but about our future? And so what does our future look like if we project? Obviously, we're very short-lived species. We're like little insects in the cosmic, right? We live for a very brief period, but what does our, is, is the dark energy ever going to evaporate? Is it going to drive, what happens if the universe expands at an accelerated rate forever? I mean, what are our prospects for the future? Well, it used to be, there, there used to be this thing that, um, for, for many decades that people would say there are two possible futures for our universe, that it collapses or that it continues expanding forever. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're able to measure things really precisely, we'll be able to figure out if we're going to die in a big crunch or if we're just going to die a heat death as the universe expands. Um, we now have measured things really precisely, but the realm of theoretical ideas has, have also exploded. So. I think we even know less now. Even though we've measured really precisely, we haven't got a clue what's going to happen. If we don't know what the dark energy is, it could dissolve, it could change. So it could just evaporate away. It could evaporate away. It could away. just burn off somehow, it burn into something else. It could into dark matter. It could do whatever, you know, you could mm -hmm. come up with a, a, a loads of different scenarios. The universe could continue expanding, could collapse in a big crunch. We have no idea. So, Rachel, what happens if it doesn't evaporate away, if it's permanent, if it's here forever? What does our future look like as a universe? Yeah, so so everything's going to move away farther and farther. And in fact, you know, if you were if you were born sort of billions of years in the future, looking out, um, you wouldn't see any other galaxies. So this this assumption. Um, that maybe we're the only galaxy in the universe, you wouldn't be able to falsify that at that so point. So there would be some point in the far future where all the other galaxies that we saw, that glut of galaxies, were so far away that the light could not reach us. That's right, and would never the reach us. The light could not outrace the expansion of the universe, so we would look at a dark sky. That's right. We well, would we, would look, we would see the stars in our own galaxy, presumably, that's right. but, but we would come to the conclusion that we were alone. That's right. And is it possible that even our own galaxy disrupts? Uh, I think it, yeah, it, it depends on what happens to the cosmological constant, but it's, it's a possibility. So if the dark energy is very strong, it will rip apart even our own galaxy. But there are competing processes. One is the universe expanding, but there's the other process, which is the stuff here um, if, um, falling into itself and creating one massive black hole. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the far, far future is a future where you have one black hole sitting isolated and not seeing any black holes mm -hmm. anywhere else. Should we take a vote? Would you rather die in a black hole <laughs> or in a cold heat death where the sky is dark? Yeah. <laughs> or both. I'm not sure it's a democracy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so, what, so finally, um, if we imagine something, which is called a big rip, right, where, where 
the expansion of the universe just gets so dramatic that it even tears apart the entire galaxy and literally the night sky goes dark if we don't fall into the black hole at the center of our galaxy 26,000 light years away. Um, so is there any sense in which the universe doesn't die, doesn't have an expiration, doesn't have an end, in which Einstein's sort of um, prejudice of the permanence of the universe is maintained, or is, or is every future that we look at a kind of a death of the universe? Whether it's a heat death, or a big rip, or a big crunch, which you've described, Pedro, is there any scenario in which this goes on forever? I'm so dystopian. <laughs> Sorry, such a downer. So there was this paper written by a guy called Martin Rees in 1968 called The Scathology of the Universe. And remember, at that time, there was no dark energy. And he tried to think of what would happen to the universe in the infinite future. And I'm afraid to say it's pretty bleak. <laughs> and so I think what would happen is that galaxies, you know, stars would burn up and they would die and then they would fall into, you know, they would fall into each other and they would form black holes, and then things would fall into each other and form black holes. And mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you'd be left with this, and these black holes then would evaporate, as Hawking taught us. And so you'd end up with this universe, which is just this placid sea of very faint light, and that was it. So, mm -hmm. no, I don't think there's any future for us. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, the future is much, much longer than the past. Yes. Right? The past is 13.8 billion years. How long is this future we're thinking? I mean, do, you don't have to give it in years. But in comparison, is it twice as long? Much more, much more. It's, it's a number so big there isn't a name invented exactly, for it yet. The future is much longer yeah. than the past. We're babies. There you go. We just got here. <laughs> Um, I think on that note, I want to open it up to questions, but before we do, please, let's thank our guests. <laughs> Actually, there, there, was, there was one more thing I wanted to show because I was recently reminded of this photograph, um, and I was so surprised that my two friends here had never seen it before. This is the famous pale blue dot picture that Carl Sagan motivated. Voyager, which was the spacecraft that's traveled the furthest from the Earth in human history, which has only recently broken out of the sun's magnetic influence to be technically interstellar. Um, when it was a few billion <laughs> kilometers away from the Earth, Carl Sagan implored the NASA engineers to turn the spacecraft around and look back at the Earth. And they argued because it was, a, it was dangerous, it was a waste of time, it was a waste of technical energy because you would have nothing scientific that you could draw from this. They knew it was too far away, you could see nothing scientific, but he implored them. And this is one of the famous images that it took when it looked back at the Earth. And if you can see what Carl Sagan describes as a moat of dust in a sunbeam, that's the Earth. And, um, and I just, I, I was recently thinking about Carl Sagan because um, November is his birthday month. And, um, and <laughs> is that a thing? I don't know. Um, his birth month. And, um, and it's impressive to reflect on the fact that we see that because it's luminous in this beam of light from the sun, which is luminous, and how stunning it is that we've been able to reflect on the fact that we are not just so small, this little mode of dust floating in the sunbeam, but that we're, we're, we're not even made of the same stuff as the rest of the universe. And I think that that is one of the most startling things that happened last century, and late last century, as you said, 1998, maybe, when it was solidified. And so we're living in an era of which is really a huge um, change in perspective on, on, on how we perceive the cosmos. And, and before I open it up, I just, want to know if you have any last thoughts on that for questions. <laughs> Sorry, it's just like, no. <laughs> Bad joke. <Nope. laughs> you people, we're going to talk about this later. Okay, questions. 